Before we start the speech, I have a confession to make. I love playing video games, like a lot, but my parents can't say the same. Why? Well, they generally see me play a lot of games and I yell a lot, but I actually don't know why that makes them mad. But they'll figure that out in the speech. Turns out, I'm not the only person who plays video games in this world. There are many other people in, in this world that also play video games. How many though? 2.7 billion people as of 2020 play video games. That's an insane amount. But that doesn't tell us by numbers. So gaming has actually become a huge industry for the past year, and it has done a lot of things, such as making a lot of different games. So what what gaming industry has done is it has huge number of diverse diverse population of video games and stuff, and it wouldn't have happened without them. Well, statistics show that gaming has surpassed both the movies and the sports industry combined this year, which is insane. Because movies and sports are the two biggest industries of the entertainment section, making it a pretty big deal. Because if you're at your home and it's a relaxing day and you sit on the couch, you might either be watching a movie or sports. So it's a pretty big deal that gaming has surpassed both these two industries. So something is changing. Something is becoming the new normal. But before we talk about the so-called new normal thing of today, I would like to tell us something, that it's a mistake. Gaming is a mistake. It might shock you. It might shock a lot of people in the audience that gaming is a mistake. But allow me to explain. And let's go back to the late 1950s, where we get, where we get to see this American physicist, a really famous American physicist, known as William Pigeonfoot who is a physicist, in fact, and worked with MIT Radiation Lab to develop radar systems because he was really interested in nuclear physics. But that does not explain something else, something else happened later. Because he was interested in nuclear physics and he utilized this cool thing called cathode ray tube, which was invented during that time, around that time. In October of 1958, something has happened. What happened was he created this video game called a tennis for two. So let's recap. He was a nuclear physicist and ended up making a video game? What? And we called it tennis for two. So really it shows that how gaming how gaming can be a big deal here because he was a physicist that created a video game instead. And then later on, uh, he, we, what happened was he utilized this cathedra tube and I'll explain why this happened. Is because he utilized it and somehow illusions happened. He created some sort of illusion of being able to manipulate the light in the game and suddenly you can just make it as some sort of simulation because that's what humans love to do. We love to play games. It could be anything but it's a game. So later on Japan utilized this idea and uh, we, we can see the games in arcades laptop and computers, and ironically, also in graphic companies. So that's the brief history of gaming. Later on, uh, we can also say that, uh, but before we like talk about what gaming actually is, let's actually appreciate the fact that gaming happened by mistake. In fact, anything in life uh, that, that, that's a mistake generally becomes a pretty big deal. Let's get a good example. This thing, uh, as I said, gaming came out of nowhere. This thing, called X-rays. It's developed by a German physicist called Wilhelm Röntgen. And he was also playing with this cathode ray tube and suddenly, in, in a dark room, he saw his hands glowing. It's a screen glow. And that suddenly became an X-ray. We can also see that how X-rays are a pretty big deal nowadays because, one, it allows us to run better diagnostic tests for our body and get to see what's more inside of our body. So it did a lot of cool things. So yeah, that's my point about appreciating the fact that gaming came out of nowhere. Okay, so it did come out of nowhere, but what is gaming? Well, gaming is a vast platform filled with diverse kinds of users around the globe, where they can interact with each other in a world developed by game developers. What I mean by game developers are just basically programmers who make video games. It's simply like a movie, except you can manipulate the actions of the character in the game. And this is, a, this is, this is really a, big, a game changer because you can now, instead of just watching a motion picture on a flat screen, 
you can interact within the game and make your own unique decisions, allowing it to be very popular and lucrative. So, we have know what gaming is, but why is it important? Why is gaming important? We know it's there. Yeah, this is like a huge question that I have to be answered, and the answer is right there, brain building. So studies conclude that gaming increases the concentration of brain matter within your brain, which associates with just sense of perception. Essentially, gaming is responsible for seeing and hearing, memory, emotion, speech, decision making, and self-control. And because of this, gaming can also stimulate neurogenesis. What in the world is neurogenesis? It actually means the growth of neurons. So, as a result, gaming is responsible for spatial rotation, memory formation, strategic planning, as well as fine motor skills. Now, by the look of the audience, it seems like this is a TV static to all of us. Like, what in the world is neurogenesis? What in the world is this? So, allow me to explain as a really good example. In the beginning of third grade, I was doing terrible in maths. In fact, my tutor told me that I had no future in life due to my lack of understanding. <laughs> Clearly, that's not possible. I'm in TED Talk right now. <laughs> so, later on, as the semester ended, my parents purchased a game called Tetris. Pretty cool game, right? It's a, it's a console game. And what happened was I got deeply interested in playing this game. But what it really did was it allowed me to use my strategic thinking and skills. Now, before I go on with what I did, let's just try to, let me try to explain what Tetris is. Tetris is simply a game, just made up of composed of blocks, where you need to clear out all the horizontal lines to gain coins. The catch, however, is that there are multiple ways to win the game. It's not one single path, but there are multiple ways to win the game, allowing you to find new approaches and methods to actually, well, win the game. Now, how does this relate directly to math? Well, math is a pattern. We know that math is composed of many patterns. If you know the right pattern into solving the given problem, you're going to be really great at it. And this is what gaming did, me, uh, did to me. Basically, my brain was able to automatically uh, train itself into finding different scenarios of problems and finding different approaches, and then I received new exposure. So essentially, in the end of second semester of third grade, my grades for mathematics substantially got better. But second, uh, then the other thing is, now we know what gaming is and how it's beneficial. But there's also some other factors that also make gaming a big deal. And that is, it promotes some skills. As I said, in Tetris, it allows you to get new methods and approaches to win the game. But there are also many other games, right? There's also Pac-Man, et cetera, et cetera. This goes on. But it requires you to use strategic thinking and your knowledge to actually win the game. And that really allows you to become a better person. Second thing, or third thing now, is that it brings awareness to the audience. It's pretty insane, but let me explain. There's actually a video game which can help us understand what I mean by this. It's called Watch Dogs 2. Uh, it's a hacking game, so it sounds pretty scary. But the game that you the developer of the game, uh, Ubisoft, wanted to alert the audience about hacking. Because the world nowadays completely relies on technology to facilitate our tasks, it is really easy for our personal data and privacy to be taken by others. That sounds really scary. So what the game did was you were playing as a character known as Marcus Holloway, the guy in the blue jacket, looks really handsome. And what he really wanted to do, or what you have to do, is you have to hack and reach into a corporate company called Bloom, which is attempting to steal people's data for their own advantage. So apart from that thing, apart from this cool third world scenario and you get to play as a character in the game, you also get to see both perspectives. You get to see both perspectives of the hacker side and also the citizen side. So really gaming is also teaching you not to understand in a way to see what's good and bad, but rather why people are doing things their own way. So really in the end, can understand both perspectives and make a better reasoning and understanding. Okay, so we have all the stuff, we have all the benefits, but why isn't it in the spotlight yet? I mean, clearly, gaming sounds really cool based on what I'm trying to explain, but it's not there. It's not in the spotlight and it's not anywhere. And one reason is actually because of addiction. Because kids nowadays play a lot of different video games and 
either on their phones, laptops, tablets, consoles, and apparently graphing calculators. I don't know why. <laughs> but it really shows that there's no limits. And with the moment kids don't have limits, issues begin to arise and you don't know when to control yourself. And this is another huge problem of gaming. The second problem is brainwashing. Recently, there were, there were many video games that create their own in-game currency and they did that generally to get profit from games. But what they did was they told students, or not, let's not say students, they were kids, to not, not tell them, like make them buy these uh, cool money stuff so that they can purchase things in the games. It's encouraging them. So the thing with kids is we develop a pattern of buying and buying and buying. And we just don't stop buying. And we don't want to get rid of our parents' credit card, otherwise bad things will happen. So this is a huge issue, brainwashing. But you know, apart from any other things, apart from these two major problems in gaming, we also need to understand that reading is always open. Okay, kids, kids should be open and aware to anything, and this is how kids can essentially know what is right and what is wrong. You see, the purpose of game, uh, the purpose of this reading and everything and generations is to allow the previous generation to give its past knowledge, its current knowledge, to other generations. So, as generations and generations and generations pass, and uh, that we can fundamentally become super smart to the point where we can answer. Is reality a simulation? Or are ourselves a reality composed of simulations? Something really cool to ponder about, right? So yeah, this is my point about reading is always open. But the thing is, reality, like the, the way we are doing things, it's 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 not perfect. We we are not perfect inside because the reality itself isn't made to be perfect. It's still flaw. There is still a flaw here. And that still causes problems, because when there's flaw, we can't fully fix the entire issue. But what if we do things another way? What if we use computers? Because we designed something already that is already creating flawless results at its outcome. It's creating perfection at its outcome. And that's what we do with computers. It's not just about computers, right? Because we see that gaming itself is also composed of computers. And that is why we can see why gaming has reached up because of the vast technology and a lot of different things happening in reality to make that happen. So that's about computers. But here's the problem. We need to create some technology that can work directly in harmony with ourselves. Because the problem now is all these addiction and brainwashing, we, we can't solve all the things at once. You want to make sure computers are directly working with us rather than just on a flat screen. It's not working. We saw it. We have laptops and everything. So let's actually not solve this problem in reality, but outside of reality. So in this speech, the reason why I made this thing was because of this, this technology, which is somewhere over here, which I'll introduce now. So I introduce guys to the virtual reality. Okay, that sounds pretty epic, but what in the world is virtual reality? Well, virtual reality, before we talk about anything, let's talk about the problems. First of all, let's talk about waking up. It's an issue, right? There's a lot of people in the world who have issues waking up. Because schools are so far away, uh, our work areas are so far away, traffic also as well, and we have concerns. That makes us wake up really early. It also causes pretty bad issues because if you have to study a lot and you have to wake up early, that's not going to give you enough sleep. Second thing is, is also that there's so many unexpected scenarios happening in the world, such as a pandemic that we're facing. There's also causing a lot of bad habits and forming bad things in our daily lives, such as scheduling issues. It's not good. Finally, we also know that, as I mentioned, we can't live in an ideal world. Because let's say we were in a class, like chemistry, where it's really difficult to understand a concept because we can't visually see it, like a proton within the atom. And finally, entertainment. It's going to sound hilarious, but a lot of us here really want to see something new happening in an industry 
We don't want to stay in this repetitive loop. We don't want to keep on watching flat, flat screens and just watching it. We want to immersify ourselves. We want to make something better. And that's just our human behavior. Right now, the industry in entertainment is just dull because we're just at this point where it's not moving at all. We're at this point where, again, as I said, we're watching flat screen TVs and doing nothing else. So you might not feel bored right now, but later on, we will feel really, really bored. We don't want that to happen. Well, VR can assist us there. Now, now let's find what VR is. In virtual reality, what it does is it takes us to a whole new world developed by certified programmers, and it helps us see things that are impossible to view in reality. Like you see over here. It's just us looking to through, uh, to, through our two eyes through some lenses, like wearing glasses. And again, voila, we are in a whole new world. We are inside computers. We have just officially escaped reality. In VR, we can be like whoever we want to be. We can learn more efficiently and effectively because majority of the world are visual learners. We learn things much better visually. We communicate much better visually. So really, VR is a pretty good thing. And to prove my point, another issue that's happening in virtual reality is the price. Right? It, this cost like around seven to eight hundred dollars back then in the 2000s. But now, in 2020, in fact 2021, the prices have dropped to three hundred dollars. Let's try to understand how that happened. We're utilizing this Gordon, uh, uh, this law made by Gordon Moore, co-founder of Intel, known as the Moore's Law, which states that every two to three years, theoretically, the amount of transistors will double within the processor chip, while the price of it will be half. So using this graph, we can try to say that over a period of time, we, we can make VR pretty much affordable for everyone, and potentially everyone in the world will be able to take part of this cool journey. So that's Gordon Moore's law. But we have one issue. We know the price, it's gonna get cheaper. But we need a super fast internet connection. We don't have that yet, so it's, it's an issue. We can't be able to come to this new whole, whole new world if we upgrade ourselves and enhance ourselves to create a better technology. So, I guess it's game over, right? Oh wait, hold on. Recently, let's say in 2020, the world recently discovered a whole new technology, uh, a cellular generation network known as 5G. And they mentioned that this new generation of cellular network is capable of making VR so practical and communications can be enhanced, and VR conferences can actually be done. So, that's pretty cool. But here's the thing, it still exists, but it's very limited. The reason, again, is because of price. It's really expensive. But hear me out. Over a period of time, we will get access to new technology, new inventions, new innovations, and really, in the end, we will fundamentally be able to use 5G because it will get cheaper. The more access to technology we have, the more exposure we have to new procedures, new ideas, new concepts, we can allow the prices for 5G to substantially drop, allowing everyone, potentially everyone, in the world to have access to 5G. That's pretty cool. This means we can make this potentially happen very soon. We just need a little bit more time. But we can be able to find new ways of communication, new ways of gaming, new ways of immersifying yourself, new way of living the perfect world. So, turn out this speech up. I'd like to leave us with a simple question. Are you willing to escape reality?